Cool. All right. Now, you can actually not even give all the rights. We've got five of them. So we just spoke about limiting one of those. In this scenario, we're not even giving the right. There is a what a term what they call a life estate. A life estate is when a person may give property to another person or sell it or whatever, but the right of disposition stays with the original person. So this person here, and this becomes confusing because they use a really stupid word here. And I'm telling you that. This person they call a life tenant. The word tenant sucks, I'm telling you, because the word tenant implies something else. This is not that same word because the life tenant actually owns the property. Whereas what you and I probably picture a tenant with the landlord scenario, they are a renter and don't own. This is a life tenant. So the word life in there is the key for you to understand that it's dealing with a life estate. It is an ownership of property. It is still indeterminable because you don't know how long that person, i.e. the life tenant, is going to live. And when that life tenant owns the property, they still have the right of control, they have the right of quiet enjoyment, they have the right of possession, they have the right of exclusion. They just cannot get rid of the property. They were not given the right of disposition it was maintained by whoever gave them or sold them that life tenancy. A great example would be rich old dad wants his spoiled brat to have a house, so he gives his son the house as a life tenant, and the son lives in the house, he owns it, he has wild parties, yada, yada, yada. And then when the son passes away, the property would revert back to the original person. If that happens, this person has a reversionary interest in the property. What does the word revert mean? Go back to. If it goes back to, the original person, that original person, i.e. rich daddy in this example, has a reversionary interest. If when daddy made this life estate, he could say when this boy dies, it could go over to anybody else. That anybody else could actually be a real person like his little brother, it could be a artificial person, like a donation to his college. It could go to anybody. And that person who gave the life estate would make that declaration in the life estate document that says when the spoiled brat boy dies, the house goes to my college and they'll sell it for money. This person has a remainder's interest. They get the remaining portion of that. If there's no remainder named, it would automatically assume to go back to the original person. All right. So this is what they call a conventional life estate. Conventional because it's dealing with a true human as opposed to this legal life estate we're going to talk about next. So the conventional life estate deals with the human. If it's the person receiving this whose death transfers, 
That's called an ordinary because there is a second type of this that is called a pure autre V. Pure autre V is French for by life of another. Let me give you the example. It will explain it the best way. Suppose a rich family has a mentally handicapped child that they want to be taken care of, but under the rules, he may not be able to own a house because he does not have sufficient mental capacity to enter into a contract, which we'll talk about. So what they do is they give a life estate to the nurse who takes care of the boy. And the nurse becomes the life tenant. Here's where the difference is occurs. In the ordinary, spoiled brat boy died, property transferred. In the pure autre V, nurse owns the property, but the movement is based upon the death of another person. So in this scenario, young boy passes away. Even though the nurse is still alive, it's not her death that triggers the movement. It's the life of another that triggers the movement. So that's the key between these two. Ordinary, the boy that got the benefit dies, the property passes. Pure autre V, the nurse got the benefit, but it's someone else's death that triggers the movement away from her. That is called a pure autre V. Still reversionary interest, still remainder's interest. The only difference between these two is the fact of whose death triggers the movement of the house. Okay? Now, I know that some of you may ask, well, what if the nurse dies? That was an easy example because probably what the old man would have done was given it to a trust and the trust hired a nurse so the trust would never die. That's probably the way that I've seen it happen in the real world, all right? They could replace the nurse every couple years and then when the young child passes away, the trust would move the property either back to the parents or to whoever the parents named in the trust as being the remainder, okay? Either way, these are conventional because these are both real people. They're both real people. So it's called a conventional. And back on 3.2 is a chart that kind of shows you what I was just talking about. Conventional, and then there is a second type of life estate that is called a legal life estate. The first one was called a conventional because it dealt with humans. This one is called a legal life estate because it is a law that deals with it, all right? So it's called a legal life estate. And under that legal life estate, there are three versions or three types. The dowry, the curtsy, and the homestead. The dowry and the curtsy right, well, curtsy right is the wife's interest in the husband's property and the husband's interest in the wife's property. Now, here's the confusing part on this to me. These terms are used as one word, dowry and curtsy right. There, I have, I've read several legal documents where different states call the female's version the dowry and the male's the curtsy and the other way around. Typically, most states just say under the dowry and curtsy right. It is the spouse's interest in the other person's property. When my father passed away, my brother and I don't get my father's tools because they became my mother's tools under the dower and curtsy right that Indiana uses. 
It is the ownership they share in property. Okay? That's the dower and curtsy right. The homestead is the protection of your primary residence against, listen to what I'm saying, unsecured creditors. Unsecured, like Visa card, some line of credit. If you've ever heard the term signature loan, the Homestead Act does not protect you against secured creditors. People that you have ponied up your house as collateral for a loan are called secured creditors. This Homestead Act does not protect you against foreclosure. In a foreclosure, you used your house as collateral to borrow money. The Homestead Act does not protect you if you do not pay your real estate taxes and the state comes to sell your house at a real estate lien because they are a secured creditor. This only protects against unsecured creditors. Now, every state varies in that protection. Indiana's maximum is 45,000 currently as we're filming this. Texas is the entire property for an owner-occupied person. We protect 45 grand. So if you have $100,000, the first 45 is protected under the homestead. That potentially means you could have some other property above other value above 45 that somebody could get to. In Texas, the entire property is protected, so nobody can get to it. Different states have different versions on that homestead. You will see this on our taxes. We use the same concept to reduce the value of our taxes by saying, hey, if we're protected, we shouldn't pay taxes on that. So if you've got a $100,000 home, it may be only assessed at 65,000 or 55 because we got 45 in protection. All right. Now it's up to 45. So some homes don't get the entire balance. And the example I gave was actually a bad example in the real world when you find out that a home that's 100 grand probably doesn't get the entire 45. They may only get 20. A $300,000 house may get 45. A $500,000 house still is only going to get forty five dollars because that's the max for us, is $45,000 of protection. Are we good so far? Because what we've talked about is the estate in which we convey property, the degree. We can do it at, in an absolute value. We can do it in some reduced value. We can do where we don't even give you all of the rights. And then there are other ways to take away. So we're going to be there on page 38. 